There's no place like home. There's no place like home, is there? We love to say that. Uh, we believe it, don't we? There's no place like home. Home is, home is where the heart is. Home is where our loved ones are. Home is a great place, isn't it? You know when you get home from work, uh, if you've been out at your place of work all day, uh, and you get home and you change out of your work clothes into your jeans or whatever you like to relax, and then you sit down on the sofa after dinner with a cup of tea and you're home. You can just relax. You can be yourself. You're at home. Perhaps uh, you've been away to university and staying in halls of residence or you know, a slightly dingy student house, and then you get home for the weekend, and it's great because you've got mum's home cooking, uh, you can get your laundry done. Home is a great place, isn't it? We love to go away on holiday, and it's great to be away. It's great to be away, but we always have a saying in our house. We love to go away, but when we're ready to come home, we say, it's great to go away, but it's great, isn't it? It's great to get home because home, home is a special place. There's no place like home. Home is where our hearts are. And there's a yearning for home within all of us. There's a yearning for home within us. You see, way back at the start of the Bible, Adam was at home in the Garden of Eden. God made him and placed him in that perfect paradise of Eden. (coughs) He had everything he could possibly want there, everything any human being could want. He could eat of all the fruit of the trees. He was surrounded by the animals who were submissive to him and whom he ruled over. Eve was there with him. But best of all, God was there. And in the evening, in the cool of the day, God came and walked and talked with Adam. He knew fellowship in his home with the living God of heaven. But then Adam sinned, and he was sent away from his home. In his fall, one of the great tragedies was that he was no longer welcome at home. In Genesis 3, we read that as he's sent away from the Garden of Eden, God blocks his path to come back. He places a cherubim, an angel there to guard the way and a flaming sword which was rotating to stop Adam from getting back in. It was a giant no entry sign to tell Adam that he was no longer welcome at home. But the Bible has good news. There is good news for us in the person of Jesus. And tonight we're seeing that in this psalm. There is a shepherd who's come to bring us all the way home. And we're thinking tonight especially about our home as Christians. We're thinking about heaven. We're raising our eyes heavenward to think about our eternal home. And I want you to see three things with me as we think about the the two closing verses here in the psalm. I want you to see firstly that we're pursued home. We're going to jump to verse 6 and look at the the start of verse 6 and we'll see that Christ, the shepherd, pursues us with his goodness and mercy home. We'll see secondly that we're welcomed home. If you look at verse 5, you'll see a beautiful picture there of a table set before us, of dinner prepared for us, of the welcome that we receive in heaven as we journey there home, pursued home, welcomed home, and then finally we'll see that we are forever home. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Pursued home, welcomed home, forever home. So let's think together about home. Let's think about heaven. Pursued home, pursued home. If you look with me at the beginning of verse 6, you'll see there that uh, the psalmist describes the work of the shepherd like this. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. Now, uh, that word follow, it's not a great translation. Uh, The the Hebrew word is much stronger than the word follow. Uh, The word really means to pursue. It's often used in times of war in the Bible. Uh, When Israel and Midian fought under Gideon's leadership in the book of Judges, uh, you remember that uh, that after uh, Gideon and Israel are given the victory and Midian flee, that Israel pursue them. They're hunting down the enemy. 
They're chasing them until they catch every last one of them. And that's the word that we've got here. Goodness and mercy are pursuing the life of God's children. Goodness and mercy are following us. It's telling us two wonderful truths about God's pursuit of us. It's telling us that that God has pursued us, firstly. God has pursued us. If you're a Christian, you know that truth, don't you? It's a precious reality to you in your Christian life. It wasn't that you went looking for God, was it? It was that God in his grace came looking for you. It wasn't that something in your heart thought that you would seek out God, that you would find him. It was that God's grace by his spirit shone in your life. The God of heaven, whom you had offended by your sin, he sought you, he found you, he came looking for you. Oh, that's a glorious truth, isn't it? That God's grace came to find us. I've got nothing, nothing to offer God but my sin. Yet in his love, in his eternal grace, he has sought me out. He's pursued me. What wonderful security that gives us as believers. You see, if God has set his love on me when I didn't want to know him, then there's nothing I can do to remove that love. He hasn't chosen me because there's something good in me that he can kind of work up and make better. He's chosen me in spite of the fact that I've nothing to offer him. But if I've nothing to offer him, he's never going to remove his love from me. He's pursuing me. He drew me with cords of love, and thus he bound me to him. Our lives are so uncertain, aren't they? Things in our lives change so often. Our bodies change. Our minds change. Our relationships change. Our circumstances change. And sometimes those things change overnight, the the drop of a button. But there's a wonderful truth here as we think about goodness and mercy pursuing us. God's love never changes. The shepherd's love never changes. I have loved you, says the Lord, with an everlasting love. Gihardus Voss, a Dutch theologian, commenting on that verse says, you know, the reason that God's love for us will never end is because if we are Christians, God's love for us never began. It's an eternal everlasting love. And the picture of the shepherd here pursuing us is so precious because David is looking behind him and he's seeing the shepherd. And and, and just cast your mind back through the verses that we've studied together and in verses one to three, where did we see the shepherd? He was leading us out in front of us, walking before us. And then last night, as we were in the valley, where was the shepherd then? He was beside us, with us. Now he's behind us. You see, the shepherd surrounds every moment, every aspect of our lives. He's in front of me. He's beside me. He's behind me. He's all I need. He's pursued me. And he will surely Pursue me, says David. Do you see that in verse 6? Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Now there's a tension here, isn't there? How can David say this? How can he be so sure that God's mercy and goodness will follow him? How can he say all the days of my life? Think about David's life for a moment. There were hard days, weren't there? There were days when it didn't, they didn't look good and they didn't seem full of God's mercy or love. When Saul was hunting his life, when his own son Absalom was rebelling against him, when his other son Amnon had done something awful to his daughter Tamar, when Jonathan, his friend, died, when he fell into sin with Bathsheba, how could he be so sure that God's mercy and love would follow him? How could he say all the days? 
because he's not thinking firstly about what the shepherd does. But he's thinking firstly about who the shepherd is. He's not thinking firstly about what the shepherd does. He's thinking firstly about who the shepherd is. You see, goodness and mercy define God's very character. Goodness and mercy describe who the Lord Jehovah is. In Exodus and chapter 33, Moses is feeling very anxious and uncertain as he leads the people of Israel and he asks God to encourage him by showing him his glory. And God hides Moses in the cleft of the rock. And he says this, Exodus 33, 19, I will make all my goodness, my goodness, pass before you. And then as he does that, uh, we get a description of the character of God. Exodus 34, verse 6, the Lord, the Lord, a God, merciful. You see, David is describing the character of God. David's hope is in who God is. That's how he can be so sure. That's how he can say all the days of my life, mercy and goodness will pursue me because he knows the shepherd. He knows who the Lord is. And when we know who God is, we can be confident of all his promises. God's mercy pursues me. Pursued whom? But secondly, uh, I want you to see that we're welcomed home. We're welcomed home. Don't you love to get invited to someone's house for a meal? It's lovely, isn't it? It's great to go around to someone else's house for a meal. I mean, if you do the cooking in your house, well, it's a night off for you, so that's great. But it's lovely, isn't it, to go in and have a meal prepared for you, to walk into someone's home and the table's set, everything's ready, all the little details have been taken care of, and you are simply there as a guest. You're welcomed in. That's the picture that we have in verse 5. Look at it with me, please. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. The shepherd has become a dinner party host. He set the table. He's prepared it for us. We're being told here that Jesus welcomes us. He welcomes us to heaven. Of course, uh, verse 5 isn't just talking about heaven. It's describing our journey through life with the shepherd. But it's especially, isn't it, pointing us to heaven, to that beautiful marriage supper of the Lamb. With Jesus. And I want you to notice three things about this welcome. Three things about how we're welcomed home. Firstly, the welcome is personal. It's personal. You prepare a table. Now, back in the ancient world when David lived, uh, the host didn't usually personally prepare the meal. He didn't usually personally prepare the meal. He may have provided the food. But he didn't make the food. He didn't prepare the meal. He didn't set the table. Abraham, in Genesis 18, is visited by three heavenly uh, angels. uh, And he, he rushes into his tent when they arrive. And he tells Sarah, look, here's three bags of flour. Now, quick, bake some bread. Get things ready. He was providing the flour, but he wasn't preparing the meal. Uh, Or you may be familiar with the story of the the prodigal son in Luke 15. Uh, And when the son returns home, uh, the father races to his servants and he says, quick, kill the fatted calf. But his servants take his calf and they rush in to prepare the meal. He provided the food, but he didn't prepare it. But who's preparing the table? You prepare the table. Jesus is preparing for us a place in heaven. Jesus is going to give us a personal welcome to heaven. Isn't that what we read in John 14? If I go and prepare a place for you, the Son of God is preparing a place for all his children in heaven. 
That is a remarkable truth. That is a staggering reality. I know that if you've grown up in the church, you've probably learned John 14 as a child in Sunday school. And so it just flies off our tongues, doesn't it? It almost bypasses our brains. But that truth is a staggering, surprising reality that the Lord Jehovah, who is Yahweh, the one who is almighty and exalted, who lives in heaven and who uses the earth as his footstool, the Bible says. He has prepared a place for me. The one that Isaiah saw in his vision, who was holy, 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 so holy in his transcendent glory that the seraphim, the angels, had to cover their eyes and cover their feet, even though they had no sin. Yet he is getting a place ready for you if you know him in heaven. Isn't it staggering? Isn't it beautiful? Sometimes we get tired of the tension that we feel here in the world. It's hard to be different, isn't it, from those around us? We're strangers and exiles in this world, the Bible tells us. We, we don't fit in. And it's hard not to fit in. It's hard to feel uneasy. It's hard to feel out of place. But there is a place prepared for us where we will feel at home. Jesus is preparing a place for us and when he takes us there, we will be home. Some of you here, your loved ones, they've died in Christ. And you miss them so much. And you would do anything, wouldn't you? To have them back just for one day. One conversation. Friends, if they've died in Jesus, he has taken them home. Notice that this welcome, secondly, is a, a lavish welcome. You prepare a table before me. That doesn't just mean to, to set the table. You know, some of you younger boys and girls, maybe when dinner's ready, you get called to set the table. Get the knives and forks out. Set the cups in place. Get the juice ready to go. But that's not what David means here. To set the table, to prepare the table in the ancient world meant to make a feast. One commentator says it was as though you were detaining a guest and setting before him the best of everything you had. And that's what Jesus is doing. That's what heaven is like. Look at the details. You anoint my head with oil. In the ancient world, when you arrived at someone's house, well, they didn't take your coat and give you a cup of tea like we do. They washed your feet and put perfume on your head because you'd had a long, sweaty, hot journey. And there's oil flowing. There's perfume flowing over this guest's head. Your cup, my cup overflows. You know, you're sitting at dinner and you've finished your drink and you take that sip of your cup to kind of signal to your host that, well, you need a top up. But there's no top up needed here because the host is just topping up your cup over and over and over again. It's a lavish welcome. Friends, heaven is a wonderful, wonderful place. Of course, David is telling us that in his own life, he had known the lavish blessing of God. He says, doesn't he, in another psalm, that lions had fallen to me in, in pleasant places. I wonder, are we thankful for all of God's provision in our lives? Look at our lives. Look at all that God's given us. Look at all the material blessings and provision that we have. Are we Singing this song, are we saying to the Lord, my cup overflows. God, you've been so good to me. You've been so kind to me. David Gibson in his uh, little commentary on uh, Psalm 23 quotes from C.H. Spurgeon, who tells the story of a, a poor lady in his congregation who lived in a cottage. And she sat down with Spurgeon to a meal one day. It was a meal of a slice of bread and a cup of water. And she said this. What? A slice of bread and a cup of water, all this. 
and Jesus Christ too? Are our hearts overflowing with the generosity that God has given to us in his lavish provision for our lives? But heaven will be a lavish place. Heaven is a place of overflowing happiness. Heaven is a place where the shepherd will wipe away every tear and dry every eye. It's a lavish welcome. It's a personal welcome. It's a lavish welcome. Thirdly, see, it's a costly welcome. It's a costly welcome. You set a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Now, what does David mean here? The commentators are really divided. They've spilt an awful lot of ink about what this means. Who are these enemies? Uh, Why is David in their presence? Uh, Why is the shepherd preparing the table in the presence of the enemies? What does this mean? I don't think we need to get too bogged down in speculation. I, I think this simply means that the meal has come at great cost. For Jesus the shepherd has gone to Calvary to defeat all of our enemies. He's won the right for us to go to the meal by defeating all of our enemies. Isn't that what the New Testament says? In Colossians chapter 2, for example, uh, where Paul writes like this of Christ's work. In verse 15, he says, uh, Jesus disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. You see, friends, this was a costly meal for the shepherd to set. This was a costly table for him to prepare. For to prepare it, it cost him his life. That's why the lamb is all the glory of heaven. As we come into the book of Revelation, we see that it's, it's the lamb who's the center of heaven's worship. It's, it's the lamb who's been slain that the throng of heaven are adoring and worshiping because Jesus has won our redemption at great cost to him. You were redeemed, says Peter, not by perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. Costly welcome. Welcomed home. Pursued home. Welcomed home, forever home, forever home. The best thing about heaven is not what's there. The best thing about heaven is who is there. Jesus is there. Jesus is there. And in heaven, we will see the shepherd firstly. We'll see the shepherd. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord. You see, it is a lovely thing, isn't it, to go to someone's house for dinner. And it is a beautiful thing to have a meal prepared. And it's lovely to eat food with someone else. But the best thing about being in someone's house is not the food. The best thing is being with them. In someone's home, you see them as they really are. It's not that you don't see them as they really are when you're with them in church or out for coffee or doing something else, but they're guarded, aren't they? They're not as free to be themselves, but at home they are. We often say that to the families in the church when we're at their house for dinner, and you see the children, and you say, well, it's lovely to see the children in their own environment, because at home the kids are just free to be themselves, or comfortable to be themselves. And when you're with someone at their home, you find out more about them, don't you? You see their hobbies, or they tell you about their interests, or you see photos of their family, where you find out something about their story. You've seen them before, but in their home, you see them more clearly, don't you? You see them more clearly. That's what heaven is. Heaven is the place where we see the shepherd more clearly. Heaven is the place where we will see the glory of Jesus in all its fullness. Heaven is the place where we will see Jesus for who he is. 
That's what he says in his own words, isn't it? In that passage we read in John 14. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. It's what he prayed a few hours later in his high priestly prayer in John 17 and verse 24. He prayed, Father, I desire that all my people whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory. Heaven is the place where we will see the glory of Jesus. Heaven is the place where we'll be face to face with the shepherd. And friends, one glimpse of his glory. One moment staring into the face of Jesus. Will mean that all the tears and all the trouble. And all the trials of earth will melt away. For we will see the shepherd. We'll see him. And we'll be satisfied by the shepherd. That's the second thing I want you to notice about this home. We'll be satisfied by the shepherd. I will dwell, dwell in the house of the Lord. The word means to remain or abide somewhere. Not to wander off into the neighboring fields. Not to go off into the middle of the road. Not to look, go looking for pasture somewhere else. No, to stay right beside the shepherd. Oh, this is a beautiful truth, isn't it? In heaven, you say, we'll be free from sin. In heaven, sin will have no influence over us. What are we like now? We're up and down. We're hot and cold. One minute we're with Jesus, the next minute we're straying away from him. One day we're passionate in prayer, the next day we're prayerless and lifeless. One day we're warm and hot for Jesus and burning with zeal to tell others about him. The next day we're cold and far away from him. One day we want to live for him. The next moment we're living for ourselves. We're wandering sheep, aren't we? We're always sticking our snouts into some other field, always poking through the hedge. But then in heaven, we'll be satisfied by the shepherd. Then in heaven we'll be free from sin. Then in heaven we'll be perfect in holiness. And we'll want to stay there. We'll want to be with him. We'll be satisfied with him. If you turn back a couple of pages in your Bible to Psalm 17. David ends that psalm with those very words. As for me, he says, thinking about heaven. I shall behold your face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied with your likeness. Satisfied by the shepherd. And we will serve the shepherd. We will serve the shepherd. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord. Do you remember what David wanted to do for God? He had a burning ambition in his heart. He wanted to build for God a house. He lived in a palace. And the ark of God was dwelling in tents. And he wanted to make a temple, a house that was fit to display something of the glory of God. But that wasn't David's calling. His son Solomon would do that. And you see, in heaven, we will serve God in new ways that we haven't served him here on earth. In the new creation, we'll have new gifts and abilities. We'll have new dimensions to life to explore, and they will be explored in the service of Jesus. When we have our, our resurrection bodies We'll not grow tired at the end of the day. We'll be powerful and full of energy and strength. And it'll all be used to serve the shepherd. It's pictured, isn't it, in, in that parable of the talents where, where Jesus is giving uh, to his servants, his faithful servants. And the one with uh, two talents comes and gives them back to Jesus. And Jesus, remember, gives him two more new vistas, new spheres of service. To serve the shepherd in heaven forever. All of our lives. 
all of our existence, all of our impulses, all the fiber of who we are, given over to serving King Jesus, to loving the shepherd, to living for him forever. What a prospect heaven is. What a saviour Jesus is. The one who pursues me so that I make it all the way there. The one who welcomes me into the home he's prepared for me to live in eternally with him. And the one whom I will be with forever. Forever at home. And as we close, can I ask you please, Is heaven your home? Is heaven your home? Are you going there? How do we get to heaven? Jesus told us, didn't he, in that reading, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We look to the shepherd in life, And if we look to him by faith, then he promises he will be our shepherd in death. And then he will bring us to heaven where we will be with our shepherd for all eternity. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever.